How are you all doing? I very, I'm very emotional right now to see all of you, to be with you. I've been waiting for this time. I have found treasure in the Bible, and I'm excited to come and share it with you. I praise the Lord for you. I praise the Lord for your presence this morning. I thank God for your devotion to him, your faithfulness to our living God and to his cause, to his church. I cannot thank God every single day. I'm on my knees thanking God for all of you and for uh, supporting the work that God has assigned us to do to finish this work so that Jesus can come. Yes, it's true. It's uh, 2.30 here, but I'm excited to be awake, to be with you at this time. I thank you for all your prayers. Mommy's doing quietly well, and we're trying to figure out the best way to deal with her situation. And thank you so much for your constant prayers for her, for myself and my family. Thank you for having taken good care of Chantal and the boys so far. They've spoken well about you. And thank you very much. May the Lord bless you all. May the Lord fill you with his spirit. May we continue the journey because Jesus is coming soon. We see the signs of the times everywhere and we know Christ is at the door. So let us not give up the hope that we have in Jesus. Let us not slumber and sleep. Now is the time for the church to wake up and to be faithful to Jesus and to his word more than ever. Because soon we will see this cloud up in glory open up right before us and the king of glory descending with his angels to call, to call each one by name and say, well done, you faithful servant. Come into the joy of my father, into my kingdom that had been prepared for all these years. So thank you for being here this morning. And uh, please pray for me as we go along. I mean, this message has been a blessing to my soul. We will continue the series in the book of Ephesians. And uh, wow, let's get into it. I will um, go directly into the share screen right now. And let's see if we can do that. Um, share screen. There we go. Okay, so we're still dealing with the church and the book of Ephesians. I, prob I, I think that this is one of the best books in the Bible that really clarifies to us of what the church is all about. And I'm sure that by God's grace, we will learn something more about what, what God's true church is all about. Mm -hmm. We will talk about the reason why God has invested gifts and talents this morning in his church okay that's what we want to talk about right now let us read in ephesians chapter four we're in chapter four now ephesians chapter four we will read from verse 11 to 13 and he gave god gave the apostles the prophets the evangelists the shepherds and teachers Notice these are the leaders of the church to equip the saints, that is to equip you for the work of ministry. And notice now, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Amen. So today we will learn, we will see our urgent need of what? Did you notice in the text? Of unity in our midst, if we're going to be able to be successful in doing mission and evangelism. 
Unity is the word here. The title, a united church. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful time we've had this week under your leadership, under your care. How much you've blessed your church and our people, our children and grandchildren, spouses, brothers and sisters. Lord, we owe it all to you. We thank you. Above all, thank you that you've declared us saints, your children, and you've given us an identity that has eternal values. Thank you, Father, that you've prepared a kingdom for us that is to come and that you long to see us face to face where we will dwell with you forever and ever. In the meantime, thank you that you've given us your word to teach us what we must do as a church to be able to get to heaven and also to do mission on earth before you return. Bless our hearts as we open this, the Bible. Bless the one who will speak in your name. May Jesus be glorified, O oh God, through this sermon. So may you wash my soul. May you cleanse me from head to toe. As Joji says, may you fill me with your spirit. And may your people hear not my voice, but yours. Guide us at this time. May Christ be lifted up. May his name be glorified. May your church be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, I cannot preach too loud because my family is sleeping. But please forgive me if I get overexcited. Amen. For us to understand, brothers and sisters, clearly what Paul is saying about unity in verse 11 to 13, what we just read, it is good for us to start right from the beginning of this chapter. Let's read chapter 4, same chapter, but verse 1. Notice what Paul says here. Notice how he begins this chapter. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love. Eager, we move to verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Did you hear that, folks? First of all, by the way, all uh, of all I want right now is for you to notice how chapter 4 begins. There's a word. Do you remember what was that word in verse 1? Notice that word. Therefore. Did you see that? I, therefore, a prisoner for the... Why the word therefore, folks? Why therefore? Hmm? Therefore, my dear friends, indicates a major transition in the whole book of Ephesians. Are you listening? For from chapter 1 to chapter 3, Paul has been teaching exactly what Christ has done for us. Are you listening? That's from chapter 1 to chapter 3. Paul is praising God for what he has done in the person of Christ for us. That's what it is in chapter 1 to 3. Paul is talking about salvation through Christ. So, folks, the first three chapters are about teaching us on what salvation is all about, what to be saved is all about. But from chapter 4 to 6, his focus is no longer on instruction, but on practicality. Are you listening? First three, it's all about the gospel of Christ to save us. Okay. But then from chapters 4 to 6, he deals with how to internalize the gospel, how to obey the gospel. Are you listening? The practical, practical side. It's on how to live the saved life. First three chapters, how to be saved. On the last three chapters, 
what does it mean to live now, to practice the saved life? And that's what sanctification is all about. Are you listening? That's what sanctification is all about. In other words, the first three chapters, it deals with justification. Mm, how we become a child of God. First, we acknowledge our sinful condition. We've dealt with that before. And we must go to Christ and confess our sins. And we must receive his forgiveness. A new heart must be given to us. We must put on Jesus and be clothed with his righteousness. That's what justification is all about. Or righteousness by faith. How to make yourself right. How can sinful man make himself right to a holy God? Then the last three chapters, sanctification. In other words, how to practice your new life in Christ. Can we say amen? So first Paul, the apostles, the apostle, pardon me, tells his readers what God has done for them. First three chapters. Then he decants to them what they should do in response to the gospel. That's why we see the word. What is it? Therefore. Amen? That's what therefore is all about. Therefore, he says, I urge you to do what? Because, In other words, because God has done this for you in Christ, I urge you now to do what? To walk. There it is in the text. In a manner worthy of your calling. Can we say amen? Wow. In other words, to walk as Christ walked. Amen? For like we already saw previously, the grace that saves us, dear people of God, the grace that saves us is the grace that transforms us. Can we say amen? Or else it's not grace. It's not the grace of the Bible. It's cheap grace. Mm, and it's not biblical. Amen. The faith that saves a man is a faith that leads us to obey God and to practice good works. Can we say amen? Walk in a manner worthy of the calling that God has placed upon you. Or else it's dead faith. And there's no salvation in dead faith. There's no salvation in a grace that doesn't transform the lives. Amen. In other words, there is a high calling. People of God, are you listening? There is a high calling that Christ, that God has placed upon every single believer who's born again. Can we say amen? Upon every single member of the East Auckland Church, there is a high calling God has placed upon you. Upon everyone who has been sealed by the Holy Spirit at, at baptism. We've studied that. Upon everyone who has received the Holy Spirit at the new birth. We are to behave in a certain manner that corresponds to our high calling. Can we say amen? We're to walk in another manner to that of the world. We are not the same as the world. We've been pulled out of the world and we've been placed in Christ in order to live and practice the life of Christ. Can we say amen? For walk, here in the text, it indicates the direction of people's lives. Before we knew Christ, like we saw some times ago, we used to do all kinds of things. In fact, let's go back. Ephesians 2, uh, Paul says, you were dead before in the trespasses and sins in which you once, there's a word, walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's who we were before. That's how we walked before when we were still in the world under the power of the evil one. He continues chapter four. Now let's move back to our chapter four, but verse 17. Um, sorry, um, let's continue. Uh, uh, he says, uh, the prince of the uh, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Let's continue chapter chapter two. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh. You see, before we came to Christ, the flesh ruled over us. We've studied that before, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Like the rest of mankind, Paul is speaking to the church, says, that's who we were before. That's how we used to walk before. 
Now, this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer, there's the word again, walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of the heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality. That's mean immorality, sexual immorality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That's who we were before, Paul says. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off. There it is now. Notice the new kind of way of walking. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Can we say amen? So folks, these are the things we used to do before Paul says we were children of wrath, obeying the desires of the flesh. Mm, we used to do that before we were saved in Christ. But after conversion... After I've met Jesus and experienced the new birth through baptism, we are now called to live a new life, the sanctified life, the saved life, the disciples life. And what is the saved life all about now? What is this sanctified life all about? And that's what to walk worthily is all about. Hmm. So what is it? Well, chapter four five and six gives us the answer amen according to ephesians 4 1 to 16 that's our study today according to this chapter from 1 to 16 to walk worthily means to walk in what unity while according to ephesians 4 uh, from verse 17 to chapter 5 verse 20 to walk worthily means to walk in purity. Did you hear that? Chapter 4, 1 to 16, to walk worthily means to walk in unity. Chapter 4, 17 and onwards, to walk worthily means to walk in purity. We will study that later on. Don't worry. Amen? I therefore... A prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk, there's the word now, in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility, notice that, and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to what? There's the word now. And maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is, notice that now, there is one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belonged to your call did you see that first verse three it says you must be eager to maintain what in other words every single member of the church we must have on our agenda top priority the unity of the body of christ the church we should never do anything that will affect the body of christ and its unity, or that will divide the church. It is sacrilege to do that. Amen. In fact, verse 4 to 6, I want you to see that. Seven times you will see Paul using the word one. There it is on the screen. One body, one spirit, one hope. Let's continue. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Can we say amen? Wow, you know what seven means? Complete unity. Amen. In other words, if the church of God is going to be this one body on earth, if it's going to walk in a manner worthy of its calling, there must be perfect unity in our midst. Or in the heart of God. The church is not a multitude of denomination and factions and groups fighting each other. No, it's not there. 
What's in the heart of God is a united body in Christ. Can we say amen? In fact, by definition, the church means one. That is why Paul likes to use this term one body. You can check that for yourself. In other words, God wants his people to experience maximum unity in his church. Can we say amen? Amen. Is it the case with us? And now we're not talking only about East Auckland Church. I praise God for the kind of unity I see coming in that God is creating. But we're not there yet. Amen. But we're getting there by God's grace. But it's not only the local church. How about the conference? Are we united? How about the union? Are we all united? How about the division? How about the worldwide church? Are we united? Ellen White says this. Strive earnestly for unity. Pray for it. Work for it. It will bring spiritual health, elevation of thought, nobility of character, heavenly mindedness, enabling you to overcome selfishness. Notice what's the problem here. It will enable you to overcome selfishness and evil surmising and to be more than conquerors through him that love you and gave himself for you. Can we say amen? So are we uh, striving for unity? Is the worldwide church striving for unity? Are all the pastors and elders and deacons striving for unity? Are all the presidents of the Seventh-day Adventist church striving for unity? Or are we trying to bring our own views and opinions? And we don't care if it's going to break or make the church. As long as my ways are promoted. Let us be honest, my dear brothers and sisters. Are we doing everything to promote unity in our midst? Or are we doing our own thing? And people of God, God expects us, like I just said, to maintain and to promote unity, not only at local church level, but at our conference and missions and, and unions and divisions and worldwide church. In fact, in fact, so important is unity that Paul pounds on it again in verse 11 to 13, which, is, which was our main text notice it says and he gave god gave we've been reading from verse 1 uh, until verse 10 now we move to verse 11 and he gave the apostles he gave the apostles the prophets the evangelists the shepherds and teachers uh, like i said these are leaders of the church he gave them to equip the saints to equip the church for the work of ministry for building up the body of christ notice the goal until we all attain to what? Unity. Do you see that? Of faith. And the knowledge of the Son of God to, the, to mature manhood to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Can we say amen? Do you see the word unity here? Have you noticed why God gave some the gifts of leadership here? It's to equip the church. You and me. In order to arrive at the unity of faith. Mm. So we've got to ask ourselves all the time, dear members and disciples of Christ, is everything or are everything that we're doing in the church, when it comes to our gifts, when it, when it comes to preaching, teaching, or deacons or, or elders, everything we're doing in the church, are we are we having, having this mind to bring unity? Or are we just doing our little thing because I've been asked to do? Or because I want to show how good I am? That's self. The goal, boom, unity. And if we're doing, and if we're using our gifts in the church, and it is not leading us to unity, we've got to stop it now. If it's creating tension when you preach or teach or sing or play the piano or being a deacon and it's not bringing to unity, stop it now because you're failing to attain the goal. Therefore, because Christ has died and did all of that for you, 
Now to show how much you love him and you appreciate his grace, do everything that will promote what? Unity. If not, don't do it. Amen. So often, many are doing things in the church and they think they're doing it for God, but it's not for God because their end goal leads to division. Who are we right now? How united are we as a church, as a conference? And how much are we doing to promote unity? And we can see there are quite some stuff that Satan is trying to bring to disunite God's people. There's the non-Trinitarian movement where some no longer believes as our pioneers have believed in the, in the Trinity, that there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, it is a difficult topic. Yes, it is not easy to understand. But we praise God we've had enough light to believe that God is one God, but in three persons. And we see worldwide this movement trying to divide the church. And we know it's not from God. God have mercy. There are many things dividing the church today. Now, folks, we, we might have our personal views. But be careful if our personal views are dividing the church. We know it's another spirit. Worship styles today. It's breaking the church apart. Some says we can use drums in the church. We can sing and dance and all these things. And others says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let the world keep silence. And so there's tension. You might think that maybe we should be more vibrant. Others might, might think that, yes, we should praise God and get excited, but let's do it with moderation because everything should be done in moderation. Amen. You who think that maybe we should be a bit more excited, if what you're saying will divide the church, what do you do? You stop it. We have all sorts of things today. We have the woman's ordination that is causing boom. We have the gay right movement trying to come into the church. Boom! Is the Spirit of God leading these things? Some might not be happy in what I'm saying. But I'm telling you, my dear friends, when the Spirit of God is in our hearts, we will seek to promote unity. Though we might think that things might be done in certain ways. Now, I'm not saying that if the church is wrong and we're going against the doctrines of the Bible, we should let the church go on. No! I'm talking about minor things that has got nothing to do with doctrines. If we are majoring on minor and dividing the church... That's another spirit because God is a united God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are one. And the church of God is called to reflect this oneness. Can we say amen? Mm, I'm telling you, folks, Satan will do everything in order to destroy unity and to bring division so that we shall lose track of our mission. Why? Because without unity, we will fail our mission. Why? Because the world is watching us. The moment they see fighting and tension, they know that God cannot be in this church. Listen to what Ellen White says. She says, if the world sees a perfect harmony existing in the church of God, it will be a powerful evidence to them in favor of the Christian religion. Can we say amen? Dissension, unhappy differences, and petty church trials dishonor our Redeemer. Mm. All these may be avoided if self, notice where the problem is, if self is surrendered to God and the followers of Jesus obey the voice of the church. Unbelief suggests that individual independence 
increases our importance. Many people, they think that way. That when they do their own stuff, they think that they're the man. You're not the man. You're following the devil. Because he was the one who had split heaven. Took one third of God's angels. And he will come and he will try to bring the same spirit among God's people to divide the church. I'm telling you, people of God, therefore, if we understand what God has done for us in Christ, walk in unity. Ellen White continues, Christ saw that unity and Christian fellowship were necessary to the cause of God. Therefore, he enjoined, us up, he enjoined it upon his disciples. And the history of Christianity from that time until now proves conclusively that in union only is their strength. Let individual judgment submit to the authority of the church. I praise God for the church manual. God in his mercy have ass has assembled many men filled with the spirit and women to come together in prayer, in fasting, to bring this book called the manual that gives us a sense of direction and of unity that helps us to navigate our way to heaven as a body, united body. I advise the church members to read your manual, to know what Adventism is all about and what Adventism is not. And one big thing that the manual talks about is unity. That God has a body and he has placed leaders to be able to lead the body. And you've been called to submit your individual judgment to the authority of the church. I want to praise God. I've met one or two people at East Stockland. They had their views about certain things. I approached them and I, we spoke about that. And I told them, listen, you might have seen things differently. And that's okay because we were a work in progress. God is, God is still working on us. We're not there yet, even myself. And I said to the persons, but you can submit yourself and the Lord will bless you. Now, if, if we need to learn some new things, God will lead us. In unity, we will learn things, not in divisions. I'm blessed to see these people. They've submitted themselves to God and, and God is using them powerfully. I praise God for you folks. And that's maturity. Because you've seen the bigger picture, the body of Christ, the church is a body and it must be united if it's going to accomplish the work that God has assigned us to do. Mission. You see, folks, when Christ was on earth, he, God used his body to touch the world. God used his hands and to touch the world, to touch those who were sick, those who were dead. God brought them back to life. So God used the body of Christ to do miracles and, and to preach and to teach. And people were saved. And when he left, Jesus, he said to his disciples, now you are my body on earth. And if I'm, I'm going to be able to do miracles through you, that body, you must be one. All of you must come together. Put your differences aside. Put your ego aside. Focus on me. And let my spirit lead you. And miracles will take place. Can we say amen? Amen. Let me dwell a little bit more on, on verse 12 to 16. We need to get this right. For notice why God gave the spirit, spiritual gifts to the leaders of the church. Don't miss that. Let me drink some water. Notice, notice why God gave those gifts. No, Paul specifies two major reasons, two purposes. Notice that. He says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to, uh, first thing, why he gave those gifts? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. And then what? For building up the body of Christ. Did you see that? So verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So God has given the leaders to, to equip the church 
to do ministry. That's why we have Sabbath school ministry. We have youth ministry, women's ministry, men's ministry, all these ministries. Amen. Children's ministries. But then verse 13, for the building up of the body of Christ. In other words, the pastors are not to do all the work of the church. Amen. We're not there to do all the work. We're there to equip the members so that they will do it. Amen. That's why we cannot have idle members in the church that does nothing or that, that do nothing. There's something wrong. You must have a ministry. It doesn't mean that you must have your name as a leader. No, you can, but you can join a ministry. I was blessed when I heard Meli was saying, listen, we have some positions in the church to work with the Pathfinder and so forth. And anyone who feels that they can help, please come. You cannot sit in the church and warm the pews. You're not a disciple if you do that. You might be a member, been baptized, and you have your name uh, on the register of the church. But if you're a disciple, you're going to become active. And the church, therefore, God has given the leaders to equip you to do ministry. Amen. We are there to, to equip the members to use their talents and gifts in order to do what? Notice the second reason. To build the body of Christ. I want you to see those major goals. The church is not stagnant. It's not an organization only. It's an organism. So it's living. It's growing. Second purpose. The second purpose God gave the spiritual gifts to the leaders is to build up, therefore, the body of Christ. Amen. In other words, my dear brothers, the church must be built up. Christ is in the business of building up his church. Therefore, we are responsible to build up the church, which is his body, and not to tear it down. Well, that's what the devil wants to do, to destroy the church completely. And now notice, Paul connects these two purposes with three major accomplishments. I want you to see that. Leaders have been given the role to equip the church, members, and to build up the body of Christ. Now, notice what, this, what these two goals or purposes will accomplish. Notice this. Until... So it doesn't stop at using our gifts. It doesn't stop at building, only building up the body. But there's a goal now, the grand goals. Until we all attain to what? The unity of the faith. That's the first one. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, to know Jesus. Amen. And thirdly, to mature Men who? To the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Can we say amen? Underline this word until. Amen. In other words, the end of biblical religion is not to merely use our gifts to do stuff in the church. No, you're not doing stuff in the church and that's it. Hallelujah. God puts a tick next to my name. No. There is an end goal. In fact, there are three end goals. Unity, knowledge of Christ, and maturity. That's perfection, uh, perfection of character here. Spiritual maturity, growth, fullness of Christ, to be Christ-like. Amen. Praise be to God. I'm excited when I read the Bible. In other words, do not think, my dear brothers and sisters, that God is satisfied with you simply because you are active in the church. No, no, no. The grand goal of everything we do in all the preaching and even the Sabbath school teachings and the singing and everything we do is to lead people to become one in Christ and to know Christ and to be Christ-like. Can we say amen? That's the grand goal. It's complete restoration. It's to bring us back into Eden even before sin entered our world. The gospel is there to restore the image of God in man. Can we say it's not only to, to save you through justification, but it's to sanctify you so that you can reflect the first Adam when he was in Eden before he had sinned. 
If not, there is something seriously wrong with our gospel. With all that we're doing in the church, if what we're doing is not leading to unity and to the knowledge of the Son of God and to spiritual maturity, we are deceiving ourselves. Amen. For true sanctification will bring love and unity and Christian maturity the more we get to know Jesus. Amen. And folks, you know what? This is what our high calling is is all about amen this is what we've been called for we think that we've been called first of all to be vegans mm. eating tofu every morning and evening praise god if we eat tofu my wife is a fan of tofu by the way so you better be careful you don't talk bad about tofu amen i love tofu too my sons they love tofu Praise God for vegetarianism. But vegetarianism is not the end. God wants us to be vegetarians so that we can become more and more like Jesus in the way we think. The better we eat, the better we can think properly and discern things properly. Amen. So vegetarianism is not the end. Christ-like is the end. Knowing Jesus and become like him, that's the goal. Amen. For true sanctification, my dear brothers and sisters, will bring death to self and will bring Christ and his love within. And this will be manifested by this love that we have for one another, by this unity. And this is what our high calling is all about. This is what to walk in a manner worthy of the calling is all about. Can we say amen? This big theologian, William Barclay says, unity depends on the destruction of self. People who are dividing the church, they are selfish people. They love themselves more than they love God. And now if you're one of them, you must repent, my brother. If you're one of them, you must repent, my sister. And I say that with all love that I have for you. And God is saying that with all his love that he has for us. Why? Because the church is a sacred institution. It's the body of not Jean-Noël or Elder Fitu or Elder Ross. The church is the body of Christ. And we've been called to reflect that body of Christ properly. Amen. Unity, therefore, depends on the destruction of self. So long as self is at the center of things, this oneness can never fully exist. In a society where self predominates, man cannot be other than a disintegrated collection of individualistic and warring units, warring, fighting against each other. But when self dies and Christ springs to life, within our hearts, then comes the peace, the oneness, which is the great hallmark of the true church. Can we say amen? People of God, unity is the eternal purpose of God for mankind. But sin has temporarily, temporarily undermined that purpose. I say that again. Unity is the eternal purpose of God for mankind. But sin has temporarily undermined that purpose. And therefore, God wants us to be one, while Satan wants us to be divided. God wants us to be one, but Satan has used and continue to use the weapon of self and sin to fight against this purpose of oneness that God wants us to arrive at. As God's disciples, we must wake up to this reality. We must do everything in order to promote and to restore unity among us by daily dying to self and daily being filled with God's spirit and his love. And then unity will happen. Can we say amen? I pray that East Auckland Church will be a model for all the churches around to show of what it means to be a united church. I'm calling all of you right now that if you have any 
desire to do things contrary to the will of the church, please surrender that to God. Surrender your opinion to God. I'm tired of seeing people who have turned against God's church to do their here independent ministry here and there because they don't like the pastor or because they don't like the way the leadership is going. Now, now, please get me right, because there are some churches that, they're, that are doing foolish things. Please don't get me wrong. They are doing stuff and you can feel that God's presence is not there. Go and find another church, Adventist church, that really you feel is closer to the Bible. And some of you have done that. Praise God, if you feel that East Auckland is doing that. But I'm talking about some who are so stubborn. I've not seen them, praise God, at East Auckland. But maybe something is happening in your heart and you want to do stuff while the church is saying, hold on. While the church is saying, let's be one. It will happen if God wants you to do something. But let's walk in unity. God will bless you. Let's not take shortcuts, folks. It will come against you. It will hurt you because it's self. It's self that wants us to overtake God. And I'm saying that with love and grace. Let's walk in unity. Let the goal of everything that we do in our revival meetings Sabbath school lessons, in our prayer meetings, uh, in our youth meetings, Kalo, are you listening? In our women's ministry, children's ministry, elders, may we be one. Deacons, may we be one. Men's ministry, may we be one. Let this mind of Christ be in us. And let us seek for that unity and protect that unity in Christ's body. That should be our burden. That should be the burden of every disciple of Christ. If, you, if there's something you're not happy with, come and see me. Come and see the elders. Come and see the deacons. Amen? Not the deacons, pardon me, the board members. The, the deacons probably, if it, if it deals with deacons, go and see the deacons. Amen? Come and see. Let's, let's work in unity and let's deal with things prayerfully. Don't forget the church. He's still in his militant state. We're not there yet. We're still fighting against the flesh, against sin. We're not there yet. We're not ready for heaven yet, but we will be ready. For he who has begun a good work in his church will continue that work until Jesus comes to take us home. May God bless you, church members. May God bless all of us that we will come together and use our gifts to build the body of Christ, to reflect Christ in everything we do, that we will get to unite and to know Jesus and to become like Jesus. That's my prayer for all of us, including my family and I. Amen. I will pray afterwards, I believe. Do we have a song right now or do I pray right now? We have a song? Yeah. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one. Christians by our love, by our love, 
Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. I'm going to ask one of my elders, Elder Ross. Elder Ross, can you unmute yourself and pray for us that God will bless his church? Because there's a mission for us to do, but we must have that oneness. Can you do that, my brother? Sure can. Thank you. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us with your word today. Such powerful words. A true that we must be unified. We must be of one voice. We must be of one mind, of one spirit. Amen. That we may Amen. further your work. Amen. Lord, if we are divided, the devil is on the winning side. And we know that the Amen. devil does not win. Amen. We know that you are the winner. Amen. And you have said that unity, togetherness and oneness is the only way. And Lord, so as you have said today in the message that our pastor has relayed to us, we must remember that we, when we have people who are veering away from the truth, that we talk to the pastor, the elders, and get guidance so that we may, between us, Talk to these people. Mm. And Lord, there is so much division in this world. The church in general, there are so many denominations. Where yeah. You said to Peter, you would create your church, not your yeah. churches, and you yeah. would build them on yourself. Mm. The Lord, there is only one way. There yeah. is only one truth. There yeah. is only one narrow pathway through the narrow gate that leads mm. to you. Amen. And we must adhere to that pathway Amen. together, bringing each other forward, lifting each other up towards you, Amen. that you may give us your blessings. Amen. Lord, the message to the Ephesians could just as well have been the message to East Auckland or the message Amen. to the Adventist Church worldwide because it is a message for us today of how we must move forward in this world, a world that is rapidly coming to a climax. Yeah. Climax, which will see those who are saved meeting you in the air. Yeah. So Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for giving us this message today because it, if we have listened, it is life-changing for many. It is a word that will see us go forth in vigor to bring your word to others, your truth to others, because there is no time. Lord, we are told that Satan knows that his time is short. What we lose sight of is the close of probation comes before Satan's downfall. So our time to do your mission is even shorter than Satan's time. So there is no time to lose. So together, in unity, we need to march forward. So Lord, again, we thank you for being with us today. And we ask that you continue to be with us for the rest of the Sabbath and on going into a new week. We ask that you be with our pastor and continue to inspire him and us with your word. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Church, thank you for coming. Thank you for praying for me. I'm going to preach another sermon in a, in a church um, in a couple of hours. Please pray for me and pray for that God will keep me faithful. Not to preach so well. No but that I'll be